and uh, yeah we'll see how the technologies like ai uh, can help us you know maintain the compliance and how they can help us you know uh, in other compliance areas related to pci dss where and we can automate the process and make our life simpler okay going ahead let's quickly look at the agenda so we will look what is pci dss compliance definition and its importance an overview of 12 main requirements like i said there are 300 plus sub requirements into uh, 12 categories yeah we, we will not contest that we'll we'll see at the goal level achieving pci dss compliance how we can break down the big rock into small chunks and then start you know uh, working on each components separately uh, future trends like ai's how and in what terms they can help us by automating some of the processes and difference between 3.2.1 and version 4 basically few of the points not entire because it, it's a it's a uh, you know a 180 page document talking about the sub requirements but yes uh, very important why is still version 3.2.1 is still very important and why it plays a crucial part here uh, over 4.0 uh, and yeah every trainer is certified uh, in whatever domains they are training so yeah well qualified professionals having industry experience and yeah the client speaks for some, uh, themselves so if you look at the client base you will find different client, clients working in a different areas of their expertise so yeah uh, and when it comes to infosec trend we have touched every domain so yeah every sector basically so yeah it, it's good to say that yeah we are we are paramount leaders in, in training and yes we we offer post training completion support we 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 offer tailor made trainings we also do corporate trainings okay and yeah access to recorded sessions so whatever whosoever enrolls for any kind of training yeah they, they, they will have access to recordings and cr learning partners microsoft comshia iapp saka ec council yeah and the number goes on so without wasting much of the time, uh, let's get into what is PCI SSC before going into what is PCI TSS. Okay. So PCI SSC stands for uh, Payment Card Industry Security Standards Council. Uh, this council was founded on 7th September 2006 by five major payment brands, Visa, Discover, MasterCard, JCB, Amex, which is American Express. But why this council was formed? Okay, pyramid first and foremost consistency in the standardization. So PCI was created to establish uh, SSC was established to you know establish a unified and, and consistent set of security requirement for payment card industry. Yeah, prior to this, uh, all of these uh, payment brands like Visa, Discover, Master, JCB, and MX they had their own uh, set of security requirements and just imagine if a bank or a service provider is dealing with these uh, payment brands, uh, he had to comply or they have to comply with several set of different set of security requirements, which was not feasible with, for them. So all of them came together and formed PCI SSC so that to bring the uniformity. And second thing was collaboration and industry trust. Obviously, when you when you collaborate, you get more knowledge and you, you build more enhanced standards. You get more insights, how things are placed in the market, what kind of new threats are emerging. Visa may be, may be facing with new kind of threats. Discover may be facing of new kind of threats, different kind of attacks. So yeah, collaboration and industry trust, obviously, when, when, we, when we, you know, get together. So these were the two major points that 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 came to you know uh, birth of PCI SSC 7 September 2006. Okay, moving ahead, let's look at the framework at the glance. What PCI SSC aims about. So this is the strategic framework at very high level. Why and what PCI thinks uh, PCI SSC thinks and what is the mission of that. So mission itself speaks uh, like to enhance the global payment account data security by developing standards and supporting services that drive education awareness and effective implementation by the stakeholders. Basically, they develop the standards, they provide supporting services, they maintain the list of the QSS, uh, SAQs, ASVs, and whatnot. So they have 
very diverse uh, you know uh, responsibility when it comes to payment card security and those are achieved by four pillars so number one pillar says increase the industry participation and knowledge what does this mean what this will ensure so this will ensure that the standards and the resources reflect and address industry needs and challenges okay the second pillar says evolve security standard and the validation so it's self-explanatory this ensures that uh, the standards and the resources that support and enable safe commerce and flexibility to use different approaches to meet those standards basically yes secure emerging payment channels yeah we know that payment channels are emerging day in day out so this enables safe commerce in new and emerging card based and card based payment channels such as mobile internet of things and, and whatever you can think for for, for uh, i mean as a payment channel increase standards and alignment and consistency basically to to bring homogeneity and to minimize redundancy and uh, support effective implementation so this is the whole strategic framework that PCICC follows. Moving ahead, our core topic, what is PCI DSS? So PCI DSS stand for Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. Okay, it's set, it is a set of, you know, six goals and 12 requirements set by PCI SSC, which every industry has to comply, whosoever stores, processes, and or transmits account data or let's say cardholder data for now account data i'll explain what is what is the account data so any entity or any organization which stores processes or transmits okay it's not about and everywhere it's or it needs to comply with pci dss okay now account data here is cardholder data plus sensitive authentication data but in the later slide we will see what is what comes under cardholder data and what comes under sensitive authentication data okay so pci dss will be applicable to all only to the industries that process transmit or stores card data of these five payment brands only so yeah if, if there is a shopper stop uh, card or any uh, petrol pump uh, card prepaid card which doesn't have these logos or which doesn't transact with any of these five payment brand PCI DSS will not be applicable on that now the question comes where does so there is no authentic or direct circular from RBI which says you have to comply with PCI DSS rather they talk about the security uh, uh, security in different circulars, which is master circular for credit card, debit card, rupee denomination, co-branded credit card operations, and master direction for issuance and operation of pre, uh, prepaid payment instruments. In When you look at these uh, two circulars very closely, you will see the requirements that are closely aligned with PCI DSS. So in other words, if those industries, those banks who are, who are involved in storing processing and transmitting of the cardholder data that belongs to rupee if they comply with pci dss it's it's highly likely that they will comply with those circular from 95 to 99 percent okay now we have seen this on what pci dss is applicable so from a big chunk uh, of um, you know sectors we we now cut down into stores storing transmitting and processing of the cardholder data now see what does a card looks like and what are the payment elements involved in this card okay so when you when you do shopping uh, somewhere let's say online or uh, or, or on a shop there are two ways where, where you can present your card. Either it can be a card present transaction or it can be card not present transaction. So card present transaction is where you're physically presenting your card to the uh, to to uh, let's say the shopkeeper uh, to do the payment and card not present where and you are manually entering your card to to do the transaction now all of you who are thinking about let's say uh, if somebody is using apple watch or somebody is using uh, you know uh, a wallet but you are not physically giving the card those are also card 
present transaction because you are holding the phone and it holds your card as well in the form okay not in the exactly form of the card but yeah uh, it, it is a tokenized value that's a later concept but yeah uh, you are physically giving your phone over there that that comes under the payment uh, card present transaction now what are the uh, payment elements involved in that uh, chip obviously you can see your card and whenever you put your card the chip is read from the terminal and then the rest of the process follows then we have pan pan is primary account number which varies from 12 character to 16 uh, 19 characters uh, uh, this is the this is the number that is printed on the card then we have card holder name then we have expiration date and we have <clears throat> on the other side of the card we have CAV, CID, CVV, and CVV2. So this is don't get confused with all these terminologies. Most common word is CVV2. Depending upon what card you are using, these terminologies are used. CAV, but all of these are same. Uh, you can consider that these are CVV2. And if it is MX, it's four-digit character. It will be printed. Uh, this this same value will be printed on the front of the card. Okay. Uh, and we have. Uh, magnetic stripe as well at the back of the uh, end of the card it contains three tracks track one two and three basically the tracks that are responsible for the payments are track one and two majorly when you insert the car sorry when you swipe the card the track two is read first but for somehow if track two is not available or not read then the fallback mechanism is track one and track three is reserved from other for other purposes so this is how a card looks like and what component it, it does have here you see the logo so yeah you you can see uh, if it is mastercard visa jcb something like that uh, only then the pci is applicable so here from here you can recognize the payment brand all right now we know we we have two flavors of uh, the same standard available in the market as 4.0 and you know it has goals and requirements and then we have 3.2.1 it has also goals and requirements okay now let's closely look at the requirement from from uh, the stand uh, from the goal perspective at least so this is when you look at closely from 3.2.1 and 4.0 what you will see only few of the wordings have been changed just to make clear what we are trying to protect it's not like they have changed the whole requirement We'll also see how many requirements have changed. But if you look at closely from, from a goal perspective, let's see, build and maintain a secure network and systems, build and secure and maintain a network and systems. Here it talks about cardholder data. Here it talks about account data. But when you closely look at there, a few of the requirement has also changed, but that's a different topic. But let's see at a higher level what these goals means. So the first goal is uh, build and maintain a secure network and system. So this goal focuses on uh, establishing a secure network infrastructure by implementing basically the robust security measure that you can think of like uh, firewalls to protect the card order data. It also involves maintaining and securing system configuration and regularly updating the, um, let's say, patches uh, to address the vulnerability. Uh, the second goal is uh, car, uh, protecting of the, uh, protection of the cardholder data or let's say protect the account data. Uh, this goal involves implementing strong data protection measures to safeguard the cardholder data, basically cardholder data at rest or cardholder data in motion. Okay? So if it is traveling over from one place to location, with it on the, with it, be it on the same LAN, be it uh, over the internet. So the second goal types, uh, it, it defines the requirement for how you can store or how you can transmit it okay, the third goal talks about uh, maintain a vulnerability management program which which emphasizes on you know uh, basically doing the vulnerability scans uh, patching those vulnerabilities proactively subscribing to the newsletters wherein you will get all information of the weaknesses of different kind of flavor, different flavors of system that you have involved uh, are deployed in your environment so those kind of uh, um, uh, requirement come into requirement uh, goal number three and also basically developing your uh, application in a secure way so it does define some of the uh, requirement that they uh, pci council they feel that it, it needs to be there when you are developing any application okay. 
implement strong access control so requirement uh, sorry goal number four basically talks about access control be it physical be it logical okay and be it on a need to know basis so seven eight nine requirement that fall into you know uh, implement strong access control now with 4.0 they have come up with extra uh, sub requirement for 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 access control right mfa requirements additional mfa requirements uh what else uh, then then we go to uh, goal number five which says uh, monitor and test networks basically this goal emphasizes on audit log uh, okay, testing wherein doing the pen testing uh, segmentation testing those kind of activities uh, come into goal number four basically you you build your network from one to four and the fifth goal you test your network whether it is working in an efficient way in a secure way uh, the way that you have wanted or not so one to four you de design your and implement your uh, all the uh, stuff from security from servers from firewalls xyz and 10 is the practical measure whether they are working securely or not and the last uh, requirement is uh, last goal is maintaining an information security policy basically this goal uh, you know defines that all requirement from 1 to 12 should have been addressed at a policy level at least so that none uh, i mean if you if you want to build a network how and which policy you have to refer so that you can build your network securely so that's requirement number 12 and by achieving this these uh, six goals our nation can significantly enhance security of the payment card transaction and they, they can also protect the card with the data in an efficient way and and they can comply to pci dss standard and the penalties penalties are very high Okay, uh, if you do not comply with any of these standards, so PCI works as binary, zero or one, either you comply to a standard or you do not comply to a standard. Okay, complying to a standard, let's say if, even if you do not meet any, any, any requirement, you can go for compensatory control. Okay, and still you can, uh, you know, comply to this standard. The moment any of the sub requirement you say is non-compliant, that means you are non-compliant to the standard itself directly. Now it is up to the acquiring bank, payment brand, whether they let you do the business or they, they do not let you do the business. Also, if you try to hide it, uh, if, if, if any of the parameter is incorrectly, uh, you know, handled or judged by the QSA, QSA stand for Qualified Security Assessor, who does the external PCA audits it belongs to they will belong to only a pci qsa company who are entitled to sign the report let's say by mistake or let's say somebody bribed them to do some false uh, control judgment and they say compliant and later on there there would be let's say some some security breach and wherein now the payment grants are involved and they are caught then the penalties are very very high on the qsa company itself and the company who is doing the business over which the bridge breach has happened so <clears throat> better to comply with all the standards and uh, if you are not complying to any of the requirement clearly tell your qsa or uh, tell your bank or who is the supervising uh, authority that yeah this control doesn't meet but yeah we do have risk assessment done we have compensatory controls in place in by so 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 time we will be able to comply to the, these particular uh, requirements moving ahead how we can break down uh, the DSS compliance we know that this is a this is a yearly compliance and it is continuous in nature every year pci assessment needs to happen and at a broader level this can be classified into three phases assess repair and report what does this mean this means that assess, in the assess phase, we assess the scope, we do the risk assessment, we do the gap assessment, and then we fall into a repair phase where in, in repairing what we do, we, we, we apply patches or let's say uh, we apply controls wherein, uh, uh, wherein we feel that control is not sufficient in us, enough and then we report. So this is, this is at the highest level, but when, when we, you know, look at the key activities at these different levels basically it can be done at uh, two levels one is key activities which involves risk assessment for the entire scope the gap analysis where where you are standing as of now and what does uh, uh, 
and how much you have to still cover to comply with PCI DSS. Okay, and then followed by remediation. Once you do the remediation, you fall into the next next stage, which says compliance validation. What is compliance validation? Basically, it's self-assessment of uh, of the controls that you have implemented. Let's say we all know about three lines of defense. Probably an independent, uh, you know, third line or second line can come and assess the first line, and after that, go for external audit. So in, in the, the, the a big rock now cut down into small chunks where in different teams responsible for different things like risk assessment by a, by a risk manager and after that a gap analysis by independent wing something like that can be done and it can uh, whatever the shortcomings are those can be fixed and after that go for uh, self-assessment so the big rock now divided into small chunks so that it can be achieved in, in an easier way now going ahead, uh, one more point that is left here is training above all. Why, what you need to comply with and what not, it's very, very important. There are certain controls which are not applicable to you that may be applicable to uh, certain are applicable to a merchant, certain are applicable to a, uh, service providers. So you need to have tra training and all on all uh, uh, standard actually on, on PCID is a standard whether you're going for 3.2.1 or 4.0 so that's that's their the training is very very important if especially if you are new to PCID is because this is hardcore technical uh, uh, training where and every control is a technical control apart from when you say um, physical security controls in uh, requirement number nine I think yeah there you can say some kind of semi-technical control but apart from this when it comes to requirement number three four it talks about encryption uh at rest motion everything requirement number one talks about network hardening and also you you need to be very technically trained so that's why uh to feel the essence of the entire standard training on the standard is very very important now why training is also important that you need to know that there are two categories that are prescribed by PCI DSS that that needs to comply with PCI DSS standard one is merchant one is service provider so who is a merchant and who is a service provider so in the context of PCI DSS a merchant refers to any organization that accepts the payment okay from obviously us and they give goods and services to for example eBay is a, is a merchant, uh, Paytm is a merchant, okay, Amazon is a merchant, okay, it can be businesses of all sizes from local retailers to oh, multinational corporations, Qatar Airways, merchant, okay. Now, the other category is service provider, so who is a service provider? So in the context of PCDSS, a service provider is someone who is supporting the merchants or any other service provider who is involved in the payment card transaction. Okay, it can be a payment processor, it can be a hosting provider, it can be managed service security provider (MSSP). We call that. It can be software as a service provider. It can be data center service providers. Okay. But yes, uh, the big myth is sometimes uh, you know, people get confused who, who whether I fall in a, a, a category of a merchant level or should we we fall in in, in a service provider uh, level. So to demystify that, a merchant will always have a merchant ID. If you do not have a merchant ID from your bank or let's say acquirer, you are service provider. So either you are a merchant or a service provider that's how pre cds classifies uh, the entities here so an entity can be a merchant and merchant will always have a merchant id and a service provider now when it comes to aws it is a merchant but the company also acts as a service provider so one unit who sells the goods who accepts the payment on behalf of you is a, is a merchant but on behalf of that aws also offers hosting service service okay wherein you host your infrastructure over there 
that part comes into service provider and depending there are certain requirements that are only applicable to merchants and there are some additional requirements that service provider needs to comply with. Now, depending upon the type of or number of transactions, depending upon the number of transaction, there are various levels of merchants and service provider. So merchant levels are broadly are from one to four and the service provider levels are from one to two. And this is on the number of transactions, not direct transaction. Let's say if a single transaction is of six million, no, that is not a, a not will not be classified as a level one merchant. Rather, it 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 it, it will fall into level four, hypothetically taking. Okay, but let's say there are number of transaction like one transaction of uh, one rupee, two rupee, three rupee, four rupee, other transaction of four, five, six, something like that. So the number of transaction count went while defining the merchant. And it's not, uh, uh, let's say, per brand, it's a 6 million transaction of Visa only, or 6 million transaction of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, what of MasterCard, but it's combined transaction. Okay? Same goes with, uh, you know, service providers. And depending upon these levels, if you're not going for an on-site audit, Okay, these are the SAQs that you can follow, but this needs to be clearly identified by the entity itself, whether I'm a merchant, I, uh, I do not have a 6 billion plus transactions. So should I do a SAQ A, B, C, D, whatever. So that's why training of these standards are very much important so as to get yourself clear that under what SAQ you will fall if you're not going for level one. So only level one uh, 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 merchant or level one service provider qualifies for on-site audit. Rest of them can, can do self-assessment questionnaire. Either can be signed by the C-level executive of the organization or they can onboard a QSA company wherein a QSA will attest these SAQs. And these SAQs have more or less number of requirements because the transaction level is also less. So these, these are based on risk-based approach, uh, I would say. And, and But again, you need to be sure that I, I have to do SAQ A, AEP, B, BIP, C, CVT and all. So these, 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 and for service provider, there is only one SAQ that is available, which is a security. So service provider doesn't have a, a, a leverage to go into ABC. They only have to do a security for service provider, which is kind of mini level one assessment itself. But yeah, these can, uh, these does not mandate you to have, you know, uh, calling a QSA on your, uh, premise and have them audit your system but the good catch here is it's, it's always good to check with the acquirer uh, let's say if there is a breach some somehow uh, in your organization previously then even if you do not uh, even if you are into let's say level four pci council or the acquirer may ask you to go for level one audit so ideally you will fall into SAQ, but somehow if there was some breach or uh, the superior authority then your organization is not convinced with your security control they may ask a qsa and they may ask you to go for level one audit okay we talked too much about audit number one number two let's talk about the basis principle what pci dss says and what can be stored as a part of pci dss requirement what cannot be stored now what so uh, we, we we read earlier that uh, and we learned that cardholder data and sensitive authentication data together will give account data and pci's responsibility as per goal number two of uh, version four says protect the account data and in 3.2.1 they only talked about this one cardholder data which was not clear now they have come up with the updated statement which says protect the account data so this plus this together makes account data okay now sensitive account data cannot be stored after authorization let's let's make it so simple you cannot store a sensitive authentication data which is cvv2 pin your pin the atm pin and its corresponding pin block basically when you enter the pin on pause or let's say atm it gets converted into pin block and then it is transferred rather than 
uh, you know uh, clear uh, transmission so pin and pin block cannot be stored cvv2 cannot be stored and obviously full track data which is track one or track two in the magnetic stripe cannot be stored once the transaction has been authorized okay now comes now comes the card order data so in card order data there are four components pan basically <clears throat> primary account number card order name service code and expiration date these can be stored but in that as well uh, primary account number uh, uh, should not be stored okay if if there is no need, uh, need to store but if you want to store that yes you can store it but you have to render uh, this unreadable the pan needs to be rendered unreadable okay and there are uh, as for pci council there are uh, four ways wherein you can render the pan unreadable so number one way is truncation encryption hashing and tokenization so these are the four ways wherein you can you know uh, render the pan unreadable now in truncation you only store first six and last four digit okay yeah this can change when 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 uh, uh, when you have permission or let's say it depends upon bin as well uh, by uh, banker's identification number uh, when the card number uh, nowadays card numbers are going uh, beyond 16 digit authentic uh, i mean which is traditional way so this can change a little bit but as of now uh, truncation means if you are you are rendering the pan unreadable truncation means you are only storing first six and last four digit of a card and you are just omitting and deleting the middle characters okay encryption yeah uh, always uh, it's, it's pretty much simple uh, encryption is basically it changes a plain text into cipher text and but you you are not allowed to use weak uh you know uh, encryption algorithm basically uh yeah as of uh, if you're using symmetric one you you need to have as 128 bit as of now but yeah it will go to 256 very very soon uh but it also depends upon qsa uh i as a qsa when i was doing the audits uh yeah my only recommendation was to go ahead on the, on, on the higher bits rather than the lower bits the third method is hashing basically taking the pan and just doing a hash of it uh irreversible as like md5 or let's say a sha uh, 2 and then then storing it and finally is a final is tokenization you you make tokenize the card basically having a different value of the, the uh, of the same card uh, or you may hire a token service provider where and he can tokenize card behalf behalf of you or and instead of giving you the original card he can give you the token to do the transaction so these are the four ways where and you can uh, you can make the pan unreadable okay now coming to the point why 3.2.1 is very important so it's still in demand it's not expired at all okay and still the companies are trying to adapt 4.0 which is not very popular as of now yeah it has made a buzz in the market but yeah companies are still going with 3.2.1 because it has not expired as of now okay multiple requirement are same as compared to 3.2.1 when when you compare the goals of 4.0 versus the goals of 3.2.1 you will see the goals are you know uh, pretty much the same yeah sub requirements have changed of only a few sub requirements but yeah uh, it, it doesn't change the essence of uh, you know the flavor that 3.2.1 brought okay and it still builds the foundation for 4.0 so yeah 4.0 is built on top of 3.2.1 obviously that 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 should have been there because yeah 3.2.1 was very mature and it it, it lasted for a, a quite a time i think 3.0 was launched in 2014 i guess and that multiple revisions took place that led to 3.2.1 which was the last standard till 4.0 evolved and when you look at the timelines here still 3.2.1 is valid till 31st march uh, 30th march because 31st march it will expire 30th march so if any company or any entity who gets compliance in march they will be still compliant till 2025 Q1. 
so that's a big time period from for for trans for transitioning yourself from uh, 3.2.1 uh, to 4 and still you have uh, i think one year one and a half year okay but yeah somewhere or the other it has to expire so 31st march uh, 2025 all the requirement of 4.0 will be applicable 3.2.1 will expire on 31st march 2024 but still when you see here if you are getting a compliance on um, let's say 30th march itself your compliance will be still valid the standard will no longer be it needs to be assessed after 2024 31st march but yeah the compliance will be still valid till, till next year 2025 so since it builds the foundation 3.2.1 and it's it's very much in demand i, I have seen multiple client which i assessed in the past as well they are still sticking to 3.2.1 looking at, and and looking at the numbers they they, they speak for themselves now if you, anyone else uh, going for pci dss 4.0 let's see how many requirements have changed so out of all the requirements how many requirements have changed 53 okay 300 plus requirements and only 53 changed okay and additional 11 on service providers okay so 53 plus 11 on service provider out of these 53 i would assume few were few will be not applicable depending upon the nature of the business let's say for example if an entity is not storing their card data uh, with them then requirement number three goes away so whatever the requirements they have changed it for requirement number three will go away okay and then talking about the effective dates uh, if any entity who is going for 4.0 even they have to just comply for 13 requirements as of now so if i'm going for pci dss version 4 assessment i have to only work on the 13 requirements not on all the requirements but yeah after 2025 which is still very far away miles away 51 requirement needs to be you know implemented after that i mean you have leverage on 51 requirements so yeah that's that's all this this number supports the previous slide as well why 3.2.1 is very important because when, once you get the essence of 3.2.1 understanding 4.0 uh, will not be a tough task now let's talk about the changes what <clears throat> have changed from 3.2.1 to 2. on a process level this is a major change okay this is the this is where the major shift has happened wherein defined approach which was a traditional way of pci dss wherein just there was requirement written qsa comes sees the requirement if you're not compliant you're not compliant if you're compliant you're compliant that's it in the customized approach we it gives a little bit more flexibility especially to the organization that are more mature you can customize at an objective of a control wherein you have different controls to meet the same objective of pci dss requirement so this is this this is where it gives the flexibility to adjust your uh, compliance and it suits the larger organization which have more uh, you know uh, risk uh, uh, mature entities basically and uh, flexible to choose between you know defined up implementation versus customized implementation also it's not required that for you know if you're going with defined approach you cannot adopt the customized approach you can these two can work in hand in hand for five controls let's say you have defined approach but the sixth control you think that you have designed a, a better control than this one which is meeting the objective yeah you can convince your qsa if can qsa convinced you can for that particular uh, you know control or objective you can choose the customized implementation now talking about uh, the at the control level what has changed here Clear definition and documentation of roles and responsibilities, which was yeah pretty much uh, not clear when when it was 3.2.1. You will see a lot of overlaps, and somewhere the responsibilities are not clear. Versus when you go to 4.0, uh, uh, this control has got some maturity and yeah clear documentation. Who in the company needs to do what is there? Okay. Requirement associated with uh, stored pan such as updating cryptographic architecture and all. Uh, yeah, uh, major shift here as well. 
uh, you are not allowed to use weak, weak encryption algorithm or all. So uh, this is also this is this is where the companies need, needs to work much because they they need to design their entire uh, encryption algorithm methodologies as well. That how encryption will happen, how de de decryption will happen. Yep. Yeah how they will call the encryption keys, how they will store the encryption keys when it comes to automatic uh, uh, pan encryption through the source code of the application itself. Authenticated uh, anti-malware scans. Uh, earlier, you just put the IPs over there and scan it and the, it, it, gives the, uh, uh, it gives a list of vulnerabilities, but those were not sufficient because you will not get much vulnerabilities over there as compared when when you provide you know authenticated scans so the case scans needs to be authenticated earlier in 3.2.1 it was a best practice here they have mandated it automated technical solution for web facing application earlier this this was an optional uh, in 3.2.1 here it's a mandate to have WAF over there and <clears throat> automated web audit log reviews are automated no longer manual reviews are accepted and key cryptographic hashes so earlier like i told that one of the way was to uh, render the pan and readable was hashing wherein just you take the pan pass it to the uh, hashing algorithm and it, it generates uh, your uh, what do you say a hash but here uh, those hashes are no longer considered as secure so they have changed it to key cryptographic hashes wherein uh, algorithms like hmac uh, becomes pretty much important and much more secure than normal traditional hashing okay so yeah at control level these are the major changes yeah there have been a lot more changes at the sub uh, sub uh, you know uh, control level but at, at a higher level these are the major ones where industry needs to think about that future trends uh, uh, that how ai can can be you know useful for us Enhanced self detection basically AI can improve the ability, ability to detect and respond to security threat by analyzing large volume of real time data. Yes, we with AI it's achievable. It can identify the patterns and the anomalies as well. AI can be tuned in that way. Fraud detection and prevention. Yep, yeah, AI algorithms can be trained to recognize the pattern of fraudulent transaction. Uh, yeah, uh, enabling more uh, accurate identification and prevention of fraudulent uh, activities and this can help organization to comply with pci dss requirement related to fraud and monitoring prevention there would there are controls related to that then comes data protection and encryption uh, encryption yeah uh, with advanced ais you 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 can do uh, i mean train the engine or let's say a program to do this stuff for you automated uh, automation of the compliance task wherein you feel that this this is a, a, on a daily basis this is on a weekly basis wherein you can just program the ai uh, uh, and get the things done for you instead of doing manual task and all and automation of compliance task. oh uh, this is repeated uh, twice <coughs> there was something else i'm sorry <laughs> oh, but yeah Despite of all these uh, uh, things which AI can offer, it does not replace the need for a comprehensive security strategy and human oversight. Obviously, who is programming it? It's it's us who are programming it. And if we are too much reliant on AI, that means um, we are not doing right because yeah, it needs a human oversight. It may go wrong as well. And and AI can be used to compromise uh, our AI. So yeah, more targeted phishing attacks, malwares. Okay, more targeted, uh, let's say, tuned AIs can be, you know, uh, uh, utilized to 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 you know, bypass your systems. So yeah, it's, it's it's it helps, but yeah, human oversight is always required. So yeah, we as a compliance guys, that we can say, yeah, our job is safe for now. So that's pretty much it as of now that uh, I think, uh, and what did we learn today that what and why uh, PCI PCI exist, what was this, their mission, okay, and the four pillars, applicability of PCI DSS basically, uh, PCI DSS is basically applicable to any entity that store, transmit and processes uh, card order data, 
in a summary of goals and the requirements elements that are involved in the uh, you know payment like a chip uh, expiration date and all track data and major changes from uh, 3.2.1 to version 